Welcome to another episode of Eric Wade Whiskey Studies. And in July 2019, I spent two days in London, England, and two weeks traveling around Scotland visiting distilleries. So on my third day in the UK, I flew from London up to Glasgow, uh, where I met up with Roy of Aquavite, and we traveled about an hour south to Andale Distillery, a sort of a resurrected distillery. Right now, Scotland is experiencing a renaissance in which there are new distilleries, resurrected distilleries, and other uh, distilleries are expanding. So, Endale Distillery was founded in 1836 by George Donald. Then in 1893, it was bought by Johnny Walker. And in 1924, the distillery closed. Then in 2007, Annandale was bought by Dave Thompson and Teresa Church. So uh, I really wanted to visit the distillery. There's a number of other distilleries that were just sort of opening up uh, towards the end of my trip uh, or just opening their tasting rooms. So I really wanted to visit one of these resurrected distilleries and it was also my 53rd birthday. So I had a fantastic time hanging out with Roy, going to the distillery and then later on, uh, we went up to Glasgow and had uh, dinner and a few drinks at the Bonacord uh, pub. But I thought rather than me just tell you about our trip, I did a recording um, with Roy and we shared our experiences uh, of our visit to the distillery. It's gonna be kind of a mind warp right now because right now, Roy, you're in Glasgow, I'm in California when we're recording this, but when this airs, you and I are together in Texas. Yes. And the subject matter that you're covering is when we were together earlier in summer in Scotland. Yeah, so it's kind of this time warp kind of situation. But uh, I look forward to seeing you, and uh, it doesn't look like it's going to be cooling down there. But anyway, we'll yeah. talk about Texas when we get to Texas, where we'll talk about Scotland. So um, we met up last year, and you were really just a great host and ambassador and in, 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 in teaching me how to drive in Scotland. And uh, really, really enjoyed spending time with you. And we took the train over to Edinburgh. And people can watch that video uh, later talking about that. This time around, it was like meeting, you know, an old friend. that We'd, we'd known each other for a while. We met up there. And uh, uh, we took a drive in the um, uh, uh, Aquavite Scotch Test Dummies Mobile. Yep. <laughs> it, was, it was still branded at that stage, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and it was a lovely day. It was really nice, nice weather. So, if I recall correctly, it was about an hour uh, to Annandale Distillery from your house. Yes, an hour south. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So, um, one of the interesting thing is, so when I'm when I'm coming to Scotland, I'm like in in, in wonder. Ooh, you know, I'm I'm new here and never seen things. For me, it's just like super excitement, you know. I've been, and but obviously, you've been there a long time, and you've been to all these distilleries, and it's sort of you know your your neighborhood. You know these things, but this time it was different. This time uh, it was a resurrected distillery that was new to you too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'd never been to Annandale before. Um, so when you gave me your itinerary of what you were doing when you came over here, I, you know, I just try and aligned it with where I could be free. And I, um, I was excited to join you at Annandale. So I, I tried to manage things so that I could join you that day. Um, so yeah, we, we drove down together to see something that I'd never seen before. And it's kind of, you mentioned earlier, when you talk about Annandale, it is a new distillery, but it's also a resurrected distillery. Right. But they are at a little bit of a handicap because if you resurrect a Port Ellen or a Brora, um, a Rosebank, you know, one of the fairly recent closures where people have been able to connect with that whiskey and taste it, right. especially when it closes in the 80s, let's say, by the time they taste it, you know, in, in recent years, it's quite mature product. So people can really connect with it and they become legendary and people are really excited about it. But Annandale has that, this, that slight handicap that it was closed a long, long time ago, I think. Uh, I don't even remember. I should have checked. I think it was the 20s. 1924. 1924, okay. So, you know, lots of people would, unless you live local to that distillery or unless you're super um, up on your closed distillery knowledge, you would be um, unaware that Annandale Distillery even existed. So right. despite them being a resurrected distillery as opposed to a new distillery, I mean, seriously, they've... We witnessed that they've done a fantastic job of renovation there. Amazing. 
um, you know, that where they're distilling is like a cathedral inside, a mini cathedral. Um, and, you know, they've preserved a lot of the original structure and buildings and used it for their shop and their visitor center. But what they've done there is they've, they have genuinely resurrected a distillery, but they are being um, talked about as if they were a startup, as if they were a brand right, new distillery, right. which, you know, in terms of the actual whiskey, I guess they are. Well, previously, of course, they had been a contributor to uh, Johnny Walker. Um, it was a, a new, uh, founded by uh, George Donald, and I can't remember the lady's name. The lady's name, anyway. So when they got bought, bought by um, Dave Thompson uh, and Teresa Church, yes, uh, they weren't going back to being a contributor to Johnny Walker Black because they did, be, or Johnny Walker because they had gone from being Annandale to being a contributor to Johnny Walker. So it really wasn't a name to stick out because it was mostly a contributor to blends. Whereas now it's no, it's standing on its own and being its own producer. And yeah. so it really comes across as a new distillery. Yeah. And I think that back in the days, you know, when Annandale would have originally been operational late 19th century, early 20th century, all distilleries were contributing to blends. There was right. there was very, very little malt whiskey. Uh, widely distributed back then. Um, so yes, I, I, and, I, and I think at the point of closure, it was uh, for the most part making, as you quite rightly say, making product for Johnny Walker. And you can see as you walk around the visitor center there, they still make a play on that and they still like to talk about it. And I, I still think it's a cool thing for them to talk about as part of their history. Um, but their messaging has to be quite clear. They have to be very clear that, that we're not setting up to do contract filling. We're not setting right. up to sell through brokers and uh, to be a component in a blend, we're setting up to be Annandale. And the right. product that we put out there, we want it to be Annandale. Um, and so I think that's you, important. So, like, we, you know, we hear a lot in Scotch Whiskey News, this happening, this happening. Had you been tracking on this or been hearing, have there been any, and what you hear in Scotland or in the, even the UK and versus what we hear here, you know, it's because it's a local thing, you might hear more about it versus w when we're over here. We'll hear a lot more about Napa. Valley, whereas you'll hear more about distilleries in Scotland. Had there, had you been keeping up or hearing anything about this? Has there been any buzz? I think it? in the modern era, when we're all kind of consuming content through digital channels, we all hear at the same time. Um, the only advantage that I'm going to have is the ability to kind of um, maybe mix with people who mix with other people, and you get to hear things when you're at events, tastings, festivals. Right club meetings, whatever that may, may be, or indeed visiting the sites themselves. Except if something happens in Napa Valley, like the fires we had the last couple of years, right. um, it has an impact on the entire state and the community. Whereas yeah. you hear about it on the internet about fires, you go, oh, that's bad. So yeah. but in terms of the impact and how that's going to affect the local neighborhood is very, very different. So definitely Annandale being resurrected is going to affect your neighborhood, so to speak, and, and and tourism and all that. So there would be a lot more talk about it in, in that aspect. And the fact that it, it also represents a very small part of a larger picture of like 20 new distilleries and resurrected distilleries and refurbished distilleries and expanded distilleries. I mean, it's kind of an exciting time to be in Scotland is you're there at the Renaissance. You're there at the re resurrection, uh, yeah. uh, rebirth of the Scotch whiskey industry. It's got to be really, really exciting. It is a renaissance, but it's also um, it's a new dynamic. I mean, we're, we're, and we'd, I always take care to try and point out that, that this renaissance that we're experience, experiencing, we, we haven't, I don't know if it's the right word, because we haven't experienced that before. There has been huge growth and boom times in Scotch whiskey in the past, at the, at the late 19th century, uh, post-war 20th century, huge growth um, and expansion in Scotch whiskey, new distilleries opening, um, and a huge investment in existing sites to make more. However, what we're experiencing now is completely different. What we're experiencing now is much more definition. Um, we're experiencing a lot, a lot of small distilleries. People keep saying, how, how can these distilleries survive? You know, every, every month, every week, you hear about another new distillery in planning or being granted uh, permission, planning permission, or being proposed or even opening and starting to, to uh, run spirit. That is true, that's happening, and it's happening at a rate that nobody's ever seen before. But what's different about this is that if you look at the capacity, look at the amount of whiskey they're making, some of these distilleries are filling 100 casks a year. It's tiny. 
Um, you you, you can have a hundred of those distilleries and it still doesn't even get close to a medium-sized producer that, that's uh, producing. I think uh, there's, a different emphasis, there's a different emphasis in terms of it's really a focus more on craftsmanship versus large production and exporting. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a niche product that they're putting out there. Um, their market is niche. Uh, maybe you could argue that a lot of the market will be local tourists and things. Um, that want to take home a souvenir from their visit or whatever. But generally speaking, in the, in the whiskey landscape, it's going to be people that want to uh, taste a bit of, like I say, definition, bring right. some uh, unique character in there where we're tasting the malt for malt's sake, right. and not the malt that's going to be perhaps as it was in, in the past, used as an ingredient, a, a flavoring, a seasoning, something to add layers of character and complexity to a blend. We're actually able to connect with these individual malts and that's that's the challenge that these dis distilleries face uh, not just to kind of produce much of the same because we're quite restricted in scotch whiskey production you know that's the regulations are very very tight um so in order to try and uh, define a character and define uh, bring some kind of uh, unique aspect is quite challenging but honestly speaking a lot of the, the whiskies that i've been trying even though a lot of them are quite young um, right. It's quite, for the most part, it's encouraging. It's encouraging, and f as you you've hit the nail on the head, to be here now, to be enjoying whiskey, and to be a whiskey enthusiast right now, we are in a bit of a purple patch. It's a good time to be enjoying whiskey. I have to say, it can probably probably be a little nervous, you know, like having a, n a newborn child or something like that. But you're the first time being a parent. You're like, uh, yeah, certainly worry. for the owners, for the doc Dr. David Thompsons of yeah. this world, who's yeah who's piloting the ship down there at, uh, at Annandale, it's, it's going to feel like that for him. For a drinker, I, I, I'm not going to suggest that we can be ambivalent, but I think we can relax a little bit yeah. and engage with the products that's bringing, um, uh, you know, nice experiences and not overcharging for the, the privilege as well, which is a, a little bit too tempting nowadays, I'm afraid. Yeah. So when we, uh, we had a real nice drive down there and, um, I feel really, really bad. I'm bad at names. We uh, we had two uh, guests with us as well. We traveled down there with Karen, Karen Hughes. Um, she's uh, she's an active participant in the YouTube community. She doesn't unnecessarily comment all the time, but she's great. She's a member of our local whiskey club here in Glasgow as well. She's super sweet. Karen's awesome. And we also tra uh, traveled down there with, he's known as Ben Marnock, but his, his real name is Ronnie. Oh. He's a great guy. And he's actually in the industry. He works in uh, whiskey uh, bottling. So he's in a, a bottling site. So, um, you know, he sees a different perspective of whiskey. Right. But we, right. those guys jumped in the car with us and, and drove down for the day. Because, you know, if you and I are driving down a five, seven-seater car, offer up the other seats for anybody else that's free. Sure, right? absolutely. More, and I feel bad because, I, you know, one of the challenges of the YouTube thing, you see names come up in the chat and yeah. you don't have that connection with a face and so the funny thing is you just mentioned Ben. I'm like, oh, I was just chatting with him. I was just chatting with him during your recent live stream. I'm like, I wish, you know, the, these team, even if they put their face on an icon, it's so tiny, you wouldn't really recognize it. Um, I think we all need to have an icon like you, Eric, because it yeah. it's made obvious, right? So I might, need, absolutely I might right. need a new one. <laughs> yeah, you need a new one done, yeah. Um, I think they were absolutely fantastic. I had a really, really nice time hanging out with them. And uh, uh, Karen, particularly, you know, when we went to Bonacord, she stepped out and I was like, okay, I don't know where she went. And she came back with two birthday cakes. And I was like, I, I was so moved. I, I, mean, I, was, I almost cried. I almost cried. I was so touched by it. But yeah. they, it was fantastic. If, if, the, if the room wasn't so dimly lit, we'd have caught some tears on that short video that we shot. Um, one of the things I thought I found surprising when we went there is when we were we tasted some new make, and I'll get into these uh, later on. Um, and then they had a three year old that was like sixty something ABV. You recall? Uh, yes. Uh, so both both their own. Uh, and this was this was the angle. Um, we, we talk about them trying to find something unique and trying to bring uh, unique things to define themselves. And they've got a story to tell there as well. Um, you know, they can hark back to connections with Robert Burns. 
um, uh, with uh, various characters from Scottish history, and they chose to to follow that route uh, when they launched their own product. Uh, very young, um, peated and unpeated malt. Um, I have to say, very attractive marketing and a very clever play on on the labelling because one was called Man of Sword, and then the next one was it almost looked identical, just a different colour, but right. they took the word. Uh, they took the letter S from sword and put it on the end to make man of words. So um, I, I tasted it. I was impressed with them. I liked them. But the youth was there, and I think it was about 125 quid, something like that. Um, it's the first time I ever used quid, the word term quid. quid. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I liked them, but at that point, I was like, I'm not. Uh, that's a lot of money to shell out for something still young. But I think they compensated well in terms of the strength and the power to deliver f flavor to sort of compensate somewhat for the youthfulness of it. Um, uh, Daniel and Rex received a bottle and they've reviewed it and they were really, really impressed as well. Um, but I thought even the new make, uh, I really liked. One of the main things, you know, when you think Lowlands, you get this sort of general impression of your head. And then so when we visited there, you, so I, I sort of went in there with a certain thought. You think Glen Kenchi, you know, you know, you, you think of that. And, um, and you go there, and then they were doing peated whiskeys uh, there, and that's not necessarily a new thing per se, but going way back historically as to what was probably the general practice around all over Scotland. And so it was really, really cool that now they're, you're going to have a lowland peated whiskey. Well, I, I think one of the one of the, the things that they've got going for them there is is not just um, so Ailsa Bay is an air right. Gervin, and they're they're doing it inside the Gervin complex at Ailsa Bay. They're making a peated product. But what they've got at Annandale is the ability to use local peat, like, as right. you quite rightly say, like they would have done back in the day. Um, and hopefully that manifests in, in a, a quite unique peaty, smoky experience. I have to say that my experience with the, the whiskies that we tried, uh, the Man of Sword and the Man of Words, um, you're right, it was spirity, it was youthful, it was bright and powerful and spirit forward. Um, but the peat, there wasn't a definition to the peat for me yet. It was just peaty whiskey. I couldn't really say, oh, wow, this is a whole new take on peat. Um, right. And I think if they do that, if, if you sell good quality peated whiskey, I think it's going to sell anyway. People will say, yeah, this is good and it'll sell. People really enjoy those strong peated flavours, especially right now. However, I hope that in time that we'll see a slightly different facet to peat using uh, examples such as Annandale. Um, it would be nice to see that that go. I felt confused by the release, honestly. And I think you might remember the conversation that we had there at the time. Um, you know, what they've done is they've branded a product that's got a good story behind it, that's gonna they're gonna try and cast their net their net far and wide and get it out there, get people buying that whiskey and enjoying it. But then they package it at 60%. So that's kind of odd. You either put it out there with a nice story and nice packaging and take away that barrier of entry that high ABV is so that people can enjoy a softer experience where they can access the flavors a bit more easily. Or you package something that's less about the story and it's packaged for whiskey enthusiasts who are used to higher ABVs and things. But don't you think in terms of the delivery of flavor, that if, it, if the youthfulness is there, how are you going to counterbalance youthfulness? Well, one way could we do that is with intensity of the peat to sort of sort of mask the youthfulness. And so we're so maybe later on they'll be putting them out at 50, 46 or something like that. But in order for this release, and this is completely speculation, this is completely speculation. Yeah, yeah. If you're tasting it and you're going, wow, this is really, really youthful, that youthfulness, the greenness is sort of really coming through. How are we going to counterbalance with greenness? Well, we can counterbalance it with strength of peat and sort of counterbalance that. It's sort of like in Texas, you know, they have this intensity of heat and there's certain flavors. They, they get really, really quick in the, in the two to four maturation. But these, these other things they don't can't get in that short time period. If they age it longer, it'll go whack. Yes. So we, yeah. Sort of manage the, the and compensate this. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's the wonderful thing about whiskey is just how much the local environment and the climate can impact it. Um, right. You know, and there's there's only certain things you can do to mitigate that or try and uh, work outside of that. So it's probably best practice in most cases to embrace that and make whiskey mm -hmm. with the provenance of your location, whatever. But right. however, with with that product, um, 
And I, I did speak to the guys down there. You remember us speaking to the distillery right. manager and David Thompson himself and, and me kind of asking and probing why they chose to go that route. Because for me, if you're going to bottle something at cast strength, which they were doing, three years old at cast strength, fantastic. But the only market for that is whiskey enthusiasts, people yeah. that are genuinely excited that Annandale Distillery is producing a product again. And and for that market, what you're going to want to buy is a any kind of label that just clearly, strongly states Annandale peated three-year-old. Right, right. And, and then, then you, you give the provenance of the casks that they've used, why they've come up with the profile they've come up with on both the peated and the unpeated version. Give us some information that we like to read and enjoy as enthusiasts. And then if they want to market, you know, through uh, the hubs out there, the tourist hubs, maybe visitor center at the distillery or airport duty-free Asia, Singapore, places like right. that. Maybe people traveling backwards and forwards to the States. People that want to take a little souvenir and a little nugget of their trip to Scotland. They're going to buy Mana Sword and Mana Words. But they're going to struggle to get their head around it when it's fire coming out of the bottle. It's 60% plus. Because right. that market is not used to... Um, and we've got a lot of work right. to do to educate the whiskey um people that are curious, whiskey curious people, about how to approach whiskey with water because there's nonsense myths out there that you don't add water to whiskey and all this right. stupidity that right. still exists. So if they're carrying that bottle home with the nice labelling and the story of, oh, man of words, it's about Robert Burns and things, and then they sit and they pour it, it's 60%. The guests that they pour it for and even them themselves are perhaps going to struggle to get their head around it unless they've been through a tasting where they've been shown how to kind of right. uh, tame it. So in terms of the spirits market, you know, so this is, this is cocktail. This is cocktails. I gotta go like this. This is cocktails. Uh, uh, this much is the whiskey market. This much is the peated market, and this much. I mean, this much is those who really like the cast strength. Right. So you're talking about a niche within a niche within a niche within a niche, and and I mean, you can do that if you're doing super small production and you really want to target in on that. That's great, but I wouldn't go. Asian in terms of branding and style and imagery, I would stick to, and, and I, as you said, Annandale. And it's not like Annandale is some difficult Gallic word that's hard to pronounce. Yes, <laughs> hey, I can people. I can pronounce Chardonnay. I can pronounce Merlot. You know, I can pronounce. You know, in the wine world, that's why they do so well. One of the reasons, and I can pronounce Annandale. Boom, yeah. let's go with it. Man of words, man of swords. What is that? Unless you want to go the Game of Thrones, people. I don't think they're yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's confusing unless if you've seen that in an airport duty free or a high end luxury retailer, yeah. Man of Swords, Man of Words, it just looks like whiskey, generic whiskey. I think it looks like a, a packaged. It could right. even be a blend for somebody cruising past that haven't hasn't right. picked it up and actually appreciated that this is the first single malt in a hundred years from Annandale. Right. It's a big story and it's lost behind that cool marketing. So, so what, what the other problem I have with it, Eric, is that it was a hundred pounds plus for three year old whiskey. If they reduced it to 43, 46 percent, let's go for 46 because at least then you know they can they can avoid chill filtration. The cost of chill filtration as well. Keep it unchill filtered, state that on the label, right. state that it's three year old whiskey, don't color it, um, but package it as Manosaur's Man Awards at 46%, a much more presentable ABV. And you know what? They can bring the price down as well because there's less whiskey. I would have bought one. If it had been under 100 pounds, I, of course, I'm rationing space in my luggage. But if it was yes. under 100 pounds, I would have brought one. But I wasn't going to pay, I think it was like, like 125 for that. So anyway, so um, but what was sort of um, your sort of general overall impression of the distillery as a whole, sort of a big picture and mainly in terms of a place to go, a place to visit. Beautiful. People, people who are people who are watching this, they're thinking about going to Scotland. They're going to fly into either Edinburgh or, or Glasgow. And the, the, Annandale, I haven't heard about that. So what do you think about in terms of general impression? The work that's been done there is exemplary. I mean, it's fabulous transformation to witness. And it's been done with a delicate touch because... You know, they've got visitors in mind now. Back 100 years ago when it was Johnny Walker production, they didn't care about that. Um, they've got all the health and safety requirements now. And they're they're making things in a different way. And they want to not only present their product as craft, but make it as craft and 
show people around the distillery that that's their focus as well. So they've done all of it with this delicate touch that the layout of the place is different from what it was 100 years ago. But aesthetically from the outside, you saw it, Eric. It's a gorgeous place right. to spend time. And having traveled around Scotland, I think it was – this is your your backyard. You know, maybe you see it all the time, so you're kind of used to it. But you get a different view – of uh, the Scotland countryside. It's really, really beautiful. The dry, I wasn't driving so I could relax, which was nice, thank you very much. Um, it, was, it was really, really beautiful countryside. And as you go in there, there's uh, all these horses that are there, really, really beautiful. And if you go to Scotland and you visit there, and then you go to, obviously the islands are radically different, but you start making your way north up into the highlands, you get a different sense of the lowlands has a distinctive countryside, a distinctive look, that's very different than the Highlands and just yes. a really enjoyable visit. And I would imagine they should, if they don't already, put in a golf course nearby. Uh, there, are, there are golf courses there and around, lots of, of courses, maybe not um, a lot of higher profile ones. Right. But I think the difference that you see is you see how agricultural that, that district is. It's kind of more gentle rolling hills and right. um, uh, you know, lots and lots of crops and things. And the, the, the landscape is, is much less rugged and dynamic than it is as you go up the west coast of Scotland or the, the, the northwest highlands. Um, it's a bit more, it's it's even more gentle and shallow than Speyside. Um, and, and I, but I think that that's, that's a good thing. And they are also on a very busy corridor there because people traveling um, from Scotland to England almost exclusively use that M74 motorway corridor, that crossing, that they're very, very close to. So in terms of tapping into uh, traffic and people being able to visit that distillery quite easy, we're not talking about Oban. We're not talking about um, Klein Leash or something away up in Speyside. We're speaking or about... Island Park up in Orkney. Yeah, we're speaking about something that you can access quite easily, um, almost as a distraction, as a detour from a right. regular trip. Right. Um, so one of the things, things I appreciate in terms of the beautiful countryside, now, I'm a ner I don't like flying, and then when you're driving on the other side of the car, on the other side of the road, with different some different laws, I, you know, I can be a nervous driver. But and I'm so thankful that you were driving. Is when you're driving, even here in California, you got to watch the road. You can't look around over here, over there. So while you were driving, it gave me that freedom to look around and enjoy the countryside and pay attention. Just kind of like when we were on the train uh, from Glasgow to Edinburgh in my last trip. You know, I can look out the window and get a sense of the countryside. Um, so I really appreciate it. But the other thing is a number of distilleries in Scotland, and I really, really like this, is they have a cafe, and none of them serve, you know, bleh. they all serve, I think, good food. And so we've got yes. lunch there as well, which is really, really nice. Either you've had a few drams, you don't want to jump in the car because Scotland's very, very, very strict. So you can have something to eat. You can get a cup of coffee. You can kind of relax. And we got to do that. And that in fact, that's how we met Dave Thompson. We had finished our tour. And we bought our, our some of our goodies. Um, and then I wanted to get a cup of coffee on the road because I hadn't slept a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I went into the cafe and I was wearing a, a, a whiskey tribe shirt. And this gentleman comes over and introduces himself, and it was the owner, Dave Thompson. And we end up, and I said, "Hey, I want you to meet my friend Roy." And we ended up spending the next half hour, as you mentioned earlier, uh, talking to him. But I really, really like the fact that it's a very hospitable place. The owner, and I'm thinking, this is not. This, unless it's a micro winery, you know, you don't get the big guys. People got loads of money in the pocket going, hi, how you doing? Thank you for coming. You know what I mean? I, I really, really like yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, that was a privilege, and that was a very serendipitous thing to happen for him to come up and um, and you to bring him out into the courtyard to meet the rest of us. It was, it was nice because what came across was um, how nice a guy he was, how accommodating and hospitable he was. He genuinely wanted feedback about the, the site, the distillery, the products, but the the passion and the clear statements that this was a labor of love for him yeah. was there in spades. You could tell, you could feel what he had invested in that thing. Um, not that, just that, money, that, there's an art going into it. Absolutely. I mean, he genuinely, genuinely cared. Um, and you, that's endearing because you know that, that whatever they do in the future, if it's under his stewardship, it'll be done with the absolute best intentions right. because it's out of pure passion. He's a whiskey lover. He loves yeah. whiskey. Um, and that was 
that that made the trip for us being able to meet uh i forget was it david the distillery manager no david thompson and um i forget the guy We've, i've got their business cards here but um that it kind of made the trip it was like the icing on the cake to a nice day like you say it's a lovely place to go and see but the food there was wonderful as well right. so it encouraged us to relax a while didn't it so anyway so uh we've been talking for about a half an hour and you and i could talk for probably another hour and a half <laughs> <laughs> it's me is i i'm the talker eric <laughs> oh I talk, I talk plenty particularly if i've, if I've had a few so um, i just want to sort of share with the viewers a little bit of our impression of our trip together, of an overall picture of the distillery, um, where we think, where they're at now, where the things are going. And in terms of also as a microcosm of the bigger picture of what's currently going on in Scotland, which is really, really exciting. Uh, I'm I'm 53 years old. And I think by the time everything starts becoming its maturation, I'm going to be an old man. You know, I remember back in the day, we visited the distillery and me and this guy named Roy we went down to <laughs> a little bit older at the time. The older that you are, the older and more mature the whiskey will be. So yeah. every cloud is a silver lining. A little bit more see now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, Roy, I want to thank you for uh, coming on. Had an absolutely fantastic time. I'm hoping to come back in 2020, but I'm looking to see how other things develop. Um, so, um, Sir, it's been absolutely fantastic having you on, and I love you and your lovely wife, who is so gracious in, in uh, uh, en enabling you or helping you to pursue this passion. You know, she seems very patient and really, really a lovely, yes. a lovely lady. She'll appreciate that, Eric. Thank you so much. I hope you do make it over here next year, and it's always a pleasure to to hang with you, to chat with you. But that's how my beard will be down here. Yeah, <laughs> well, we'll get to see each other in a, about a week's time, I guess. Oh yeah, that's, well, actually, we're look, we're meeting each other right now. Yeah, in Texas. <laughs> it's fabulous. <laughs> all right. Really excited about that. Thanks for having me on, Eric, and I wish all you right. all the very, very best. All right, cheers. All right. So even though I didn't buy a bottle of their three-year-old, it was like 126 uh, pounds, and I was sort of rationing my space and my luggage. I did pick up a couple samples of their New Make Spirit which they uh, call their rascally liquor. Uh, this is their new make. And this one is their peated new make. Now, I, most of us whiskey drinkers, we don't sit around drinking new make. It's, I don't think that's really uh, the main thing we want to do with it. Some people, you know, might make a cocktail with it. So to treat it like a, a gin or a vodka, although that's a whole other thing. Gin and vodka are highly rectified spirits. Gin is a vodka with uh, an infused botanical, principally juniper, but potentially others. So this is not a highly rectified spirit, but it is a clear spirit, and it's certainly not as high AB as, uh, or it wasn't distilled as high as uh, ABV as a vodka or, or a gin. Uh, but I think it really is a good uh, learning experience to taste um, the the whiskey in its infancy, because it's ac actually whiskey until it's been aged for three years, but then try it again years later and be able to, to compare the two and sort of experience what uh, the cask does to a whiskey. But also, um, you can certainly spoil a new make with bad casks or something else go wrong, um, but you can't make a good whiskey without a good base spirit. So if someone is uh, paying attention to what they're doing, and putting in the details and making a good new make, pretty good uh, indication they're probably going to do well with the cast and other choices they make as well. So, just for the heck of it, because I've never done a review of a new make, guess what color it is? It's clear water white, right? I mean, from this standpoint, it looks like water. It looks like uh, vodka. It doesn't quite look like water because of uh, the weight of it and the viscosity of it. It doesn't quite flow around the glass like water does. And typical new makes, you're going to get that green note. And with very young whiskeys, you can get that green note in it. And the fact, that's an, another reason why you want to try a new make is so that when something is really, really, really young and it's shown there's certain characteristics to it, you can go, this is probably a very new whiskey because some of the new make spirit is still shining through. So you get green apples. Get some kind of herbal notes. Almost like a little bit of something like a Christmas tree, like juniper. There's a grapefruit note that kind of reminds me a little bit of like a Sauvignon Blanc. 
But there's also a sort of a medicinal cotton ball note to it as well. You think of a cotton swab that's been maybe dipped in alcohol, you know, before you get your inoculation, they, they do it alcohol and they rub it on your arm, kind of that character to it. Has a little some spice in it, but not spice that you would get from oak, not oak spice, but sort of a white pepper note. All right, let's try it on the palate just for the heck of it. Sixty three point five percent alcohol by volume. And it says hello. It really, really does. Really, really, really powerful. So this isn't a new make that they didn't sort of water it back for uh, average consumption. This is ready to go into a cask. It's nice. It's lively. Um, it seems very vibrant. It seems very fresh. I get citrus notes to it. I do get that definitely a malty character to it. The moth, the sort of cotton ball medicinal notes aren't there. There is that, still that little sort of a... Um, white pepper note to it. And on the back end, it's actually got some floral notes. Let's try the peated one. Mm -hmm. Wee! Wee! Yep, this one's also 63.5. And it's a schnoz full of smoke. If you like peated whiskey, and you like the, the peatier the better, Maybe you gotta just try to buy some uh, buy some new make that's been peated and just tr try that. And all I'm getting is smoke. I don't get anything other than smoke. Let's try it on the palate. Mmm. It's actually tasty. And the mouthfeel, it doesn't have the same tingling sensation as the regular new make. But it is a mouth full of smoke. There's some maltiness there, and that's about it, right? It, this wants to be married to an oak cask, but it's still, it's very, very interesting. Now, the other thing you could do with this, if you had a non-peated whiskey, and you wanted to just peat it up a little bit, you could take a little bit of this and add it to a non-peated whiskey, just to add a little bit of that peat character, and I'm sure a little bit goes a long way. It's more of an academic educational experience than it is something you're going to sit around, you know, and drink. But I think it's something, if you have an opportunity to, uh, to try, definitely do it. It's a, just a great learning experience. Alrighty, so uh, the weather and everything uh, on the day of our visit to Annandale Distillery was absolutely fantastic. And I took a lot of photos. So I thought uh, in this video with uh, sharing with you some of my uh, photography and video, uh, of our tour around Annandale Distillery. And if you subscribe to this channel, I want to thank you very much. If you haven't yet subscribed, would you like watching my videos? I would greatly appreciate it if you would subscribe and uh, check out the distillery. If you're ever in Scotland and get the opportunity to visit Annandale, highly, highly, highly recommend it. Hey, if you like my review, be sure to check out these other whiskey videos.